Hey guys, I'm Mark. Today, before I start my video, I wanted to introduce to you our dogs here at the farm. Uh, this is Annie and this is Kira. Uh, they're two Rottweilers. Um, I feel like sometimes these dogs get a bad reputation, but they're actually really, really sweet. You just gotta be sweet back with them. Uh, Kira is eight years old and Annie is almost one years old. Don't eat that. But uh, I call Annie Sweetie Pie. Yeah because she is such a sweetie pie. And this one over here, I call her Piggy Bear because she makes little snorts like a, like a pig and she looks like a black bear. And they are just wonderful, wonderful puppies. Anyway, um, <clears throat> when you have a greenhouse, it affords you to do, a lot, to do a lot of really cool things that you couldn't otherwise do. Uh, today it's late January and it's really, really cold outside, but it's really nice in here. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to show you some of our tropical sort of things uh, that we grow and that we're able to keep and hold on to during the winter time. Uh, maybe a good place to start, I guess, will be with these uh, sago palms, which are not really palms, they're actually cycads. Um, cycads are a really, really ancient group of plants. They've been around since at least the Jurassic period with the dinosaurs and things like that. <clears throat> Some parts of the world, people will uh, grow these or uh, harvest these to, to even eat them. What they'll do is they'll, they'll cut out the pith. It's called a pith inside, uh, which they'll sort of grind up and turn into a starch. Um, and, and one tree can provide quite a bit of, uh, of starch. In the wild, these can get about maybe 15, 20 feet tall. Uh, here they're in containers, so they're going to stay a lot smaller. Uh, I'm six feet tall, so you can sort of get a gauge of, of what these are like. Uh, but they're about 15 years old. They've been in these pots at least for about 15 years, uh, maybe even 20 years, I think. Uh, you can see some of the little, there's some little babies at the bottoms of them. And those could probably get cut out and turned into new plants, potted up. Uh, I wish I could show you at certain times of the year, they get a, they're old enough where they get a big, like cone-like structure in the middle of them, which is a really, it's a really interesting thing to see, but I don't see any that are doing it right now. But maybe, uh, maybe when they have one going on later, I'll make a little video about that to show you. Uh, so that's the cycads. Moving on, uh, these are lantana. Some of these lantana are 30 years old. A lot of them are 25. Uh, they're in 24 inch pots. We got about 25 of them and in the spring and summer, pretty much everything inside this greenhouse that I'm going to show you today, in the spring and summer, we move it out of here and we put them outside around the nursery, around the farm. And then uh, in the wintertime, we'll move everything back into this greenhouse to, uh, so that it doesn't die or get really injured by the cold weather. Um, and that's the case for these lantana. They're really nice to keep large specimens of because, well, for a few reasons. Uh, number one, they, they seem to just bloom year round in a situation like ours. Um, another huge thing is they attract butterflies like crazy. Butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, in fact, in the springtime, uh, when we haven't quite moved these out outside yet, we'll get hummingbirds that come in here and they kind of defend their, uh, their territory over the lantana. It's pretty neat to see. They're actually like really territorial birds. Um, they come in a lot of different colors. Uh, you can see actually behind me here, there's an interesting uh, weeping kind. It's just a white weeping type. So that'd be really neat in like a hanging basket or a window box, something like that. Um, I'd like to find one to show you. Here's one over here. Like I say, they're pretty old. Some of them are really old. If I can tip that up, I can show you the trunk of it that's, that's kind of developed. We've, uh, we've even had, one guy came in here last year, he wanted to buy one for, uh, to use as a bonsai. But I'm not so sure that that would really work out too well. Uh, let's see. We can come over here. Look at, this, look at this red one. This red one's just wild. They get cut back in the fall. Pretty much a lot of this stuff gets uh, cut back in the fall right before we move it inside just to make it a little bit smaller, a little bit more easy to manage. We can fit a lot more in here. 
uh, and then over the course of the summer, they'll, they'll fill out. They'll actually get really pretty big. Uh, and if you were to buy <clears throat> or get a small pot of lantana, depending on where you are in the country, if you put it in the ground outside, they grow pretty fast, a lot of types. Uh, so it, it wouldn't be uncommon to plant a uh, small lantana in the ground in the spring around here and have it get to be about that big by the end of summer. Um, they're pretty neat. You'll see uh, throughout here, interspersing amongst the lantana, we have some, uh, some amaryllis pots. These are a neat flower. They're, they're very easy to care for, very low maintenance um, type of thing. You can see how, how many bulbs are in there. A lot of these, um, there's about 20 pots in and throughout here. And a lot of these have been in these exact pots for maybe 20 years or more, which actually, which actually helps them out. They seem to do better once the bulbs start to divide and they kind of compete with each other like this. Um, you can see they're like, they're like little onions. And they just kind of, I guess they, they press up against each other and they can kind of feel that competition, which, um, which encourages a really strong plant. Typically, they'll all be in bloom around Easter. Right now, we just have a few plants that are kind of coming in early. But uh, around Easter time, some of these pots will have as many as like 40 or 50 blooms on them at the same time. Um, so maybe I'll do, a, uh, I'll do a little video later in the spring when that's going on and kind of show you how they work and how they look. Uh, customers just go wild for them. It's a ton of color. Anyway, let's move on down this direction. Uh, over here, we have some of our fig trees. Uh, a lot of people call these ficus trees. Uh, you see them in, in malls a lot. Ficus is just a Latin name for fig. Uh, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of ficuses. This is a ficus benjamina or a benjamin fig or a weeping fig, a lot of people call them. And uh, yeah, you'll see them a lot in malls, uh, much bigger than this in a lot of cases. Um, in the wild, this tree can get to be about 60 feet tall and even wider than that. Uh, they get a real big spread on them, which I've never seen one, but I really would like to because I bet that looks pretty wild. Uh, the claim to fame for this, or what I think one of my favorite features about it is it has just such uh, pale bark on it. The, uh, the, the tree itself and the wood itself is really light against the, the really dark colored leaves. It's a really pretty interesting contrast. It does get berries on it or figs on it, but they're very, very small um, and they're really hard. So I don't know if you could eat, I guess technically you could eat them maybe, uh, but in the wild on a, on a much bigger tree, it's probably a different, the, the fruit probably comes out a little bit of a different way. I, I wouldn't know. Uh, but these particular trees are about 30 years old or they've been in these pots for about 30 years. It's just a 24 inch pot. And uh, you can see they're doing just fine really. Um, as far as uh, nutrition goes, the lantanas, the cycads, the ficus trees, some of the other stuff I'm going to show you, it all gets pretty much the same care as far as fertilization. Uh, we just use, we call it fertigation water. It's um, basically water that has water soluble fertilizer in it, like blue, like miracle Grow. But we use a very small percentage and we do it all the time. Like, we, like every time we water this tree, it's just a, a very light solution of, uh, of fertilizer mixed in with the water, as opposed to, you know, clear water, clear water, clear water, fertilize, and then clear water, clear, so on and so forth. Now, every once in a while, I will say that we, um, <clears throat> we go on a, a clear water cycle. So we'll, uh, we'll flush the pots out uh, with clear water for several days, and that just kind of helps to uh, get rid of any buildup of salts that might take place every time salts can build up in the pots and around the roots. So if you run clear water through there every once in a while, uh, several times in a row, that kind of flushes that out. But uh, that's pretty much how we, how we uh, fertilize or feed all of this stuff. Uh, moving on, you'll see in between the, uh, the Benjamin figs. We had, they just look like empty pots, but uh, actually I just, uh, I just cut down uh, all the stuff that was in there. Inside of here is, is uh, I think it's turmeric root, 
it's people call it flowering ginger. Hi, sweet pie. Let me show you a root. Show you, I'm not kidding. There actually is something planted in here. Um, I'll take a video later on in the summer of what these what these turn into. They're pretty wild plants. The flower on them pretty much looks like a like a psychedelic pine cone. But uh, yeah, I'll go on a, I'll go in more detail about what they look like later in the summer. We're not going to see much action out of those until about late spring is when they'll start to emerge from the soil again. <clears throat> so we'll continue on this way. Uh, over here and behind me is another type of fig. This is a uh, ficus elastica, I think it's called. It's just a, um, a lot of people just call it a rubber tree. And that's different from, it's not, it's not the para rubber tree in South America. In South, there's a tree that's native to South America that uh, is commercially used, commercially grown for, uh, for natural rubber. That's not what this is, although this um, also does produce latex uh, that can be used to make rubber. Uh, it's not what it's not what we're um, more familiar with. This one is a uh, native to Asia, and uh, this specific specimen is about 20 years old, and you can see it's been pruned before it was brought in for the fall. It's got some new shoots coming off of it. Uh, these these can get really really big in the wild. Actually, in India, some parts of I think northeast India they will train the roots of these into bridges. Like some parts of that, of that uh, area, they're really mountainous and they have streams going through them. And what they'll do is um, they'll train the roots of one of these trees across like a log that, that spans the river. And then as the log rots away, the roots stay behind and they'll just keep training the roots and training the roots into these really interesting bridges. Uh, and not only um, do they have to not bring in materials or shape it, the bridges are also really flexible by way of them being uh, just roots. Um, so they will, they will withstand flooding. Uh, so that's a little bit about that one. 